very much, um, Luke, for your very insightful talk. And thank you to all the uh, panel members for sticking to your time, which allows us to have a couple of minutes, I'm looking at the end, five minutes, uh, for questions. If I can ask for a couple of questions from the audience, please be concise and short and brief so as to give more time to others as well. We see one, two, three, starting with Neil, please. This is for Jason. Um, in the Rio Declaration, the duty to cooperate is split into two separate principles. Principle 19 dealing with uh, transboundary notification and consultation, and principle 27. The Global Pact just has basically principle 18. Do you have a view on whether it would be preferable and more clear to have a separate uh, provision on notification and consultation? Um, uh, as a different principle than principle 18 of the pack right Thank you. We collect a couple of questions. You please. Certain de nos documents de travail indiquent que certains de nos documents de travail indiquent que l'objet du pacte sur l'environnement est de codifier les principes de droit international de l'environnement, tandis que d'autres, d'autres documents indique qu'il n'est pas nécessaire pour un texte à vocation mondiale d'y apporter trop de précisions. Alors, codifier et ne pas apporter de précision, je me demande si c'est compatible. Et puis, le, le, le pacte, est-ce qu'on peut situer la valeur juridique du futur pacte sur l'environnement par rapport à la valeur juridique des autres pactes, des autres pactes et des autres traités, traités ou apports internationaux Thank you very much. One more question. Moi, j'ai une question sur la responsabilité commune et différenciée parce qu'à Naomi, c'est vrai que tous les États, enfin tous les États en développement, ont évoqué ce principe comme étant un principe important. Et je pense que oui, c'est important de reconnaître que tous les États n'ont pas la même responsabilité historique. Mais comment on fait pour inclure ce principe Parce que vous avez bien pointé les limites et les problèmes. Comment on fait pour inclure ce principe sans qu'il rende les autres principes du pacte euh, beaucoup plus faibles ou que ça devienne un principe qui permette de se soustraire à toute obligation de certains pays Et moi, par rapport à ce principe de la économique différenciée, je voulais savoir sur la forme, pourquoi est-il à l'article 20, euh, assez loin, à la fin du texte uh marketing of the city one one more question please uh, the the microphone the utility has reached a statement of customary international law uh, because Christopher Stone in his article in 2005 uh, rejected in another constant, uh, uh, context, and, but if you compare these two articles, the should trees have taken, and that one, the line of argument is the same. Okay, thank you very much. There seem to be a lot of questions to Jason and Jorge, but I would like to open the panel uh, for all panel members to respond to the questions. Um, but maybe we start yeah, sure. with you, Jorge. <coughs> yes. <coughs> Apologies. So let me answer in English. It's, uh, so essentially, uh, three questions. Uh, I'll just look at the two CVDR. Uh, maybe time, if time permitting, I, I can say something about uh, codification and so on, but only if time permits. So CVDR, uh, how to include that? How to include the issue of CVDR and why it is in uh, Article 20? Both, are, both, both questions are related. So there are three ways to include CVDR uh, in a harmless manner. There are three ways. Uh, two that are politically unrealistic, and one which is politically realistic. And that's why it is in Article 20. So essentially, so there are the first way is to put CVDR in a contained manner in each one of the principles. In each one of the principles. That's what happened in Principle 2 of the Real Declaration for Prevention. So if you compare Principle 2 of the Real Declaration to Principle 21 of the Stockholm Declaration, the only difference is that in the real declaration, they would say that state will exploit their natural resources, blah, 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 in accordance to where the, their environmental 
undevelopmental policies. The undevelopmental was not in Stockholm. Okay? That, was, uh, that was important. So one way would be to actually say, well, this is all you get in terms of differentiation. You put it in each very principle. Why is it political and realistic? First, you have to revisit all the principles. And second, you will never be able to actually exclude totally the possibility of interpretation on the basis of CBDR because you have 31 c of the Vienna Convention. So it would be a concession free of charge. You see? So what is the other option? The other option would be to actually restrict the formulation of CBDR itself. That, I think, that no developing country would be even close to accept any reformulation of that. So the only way that you have, the only way that you have is to define CBDR, not restrict it to say it doesn't apply to environmental principles, but without restricting the, the scope of application, actually try to pin it down, to define it very clearly with wording that would be binding as a matter of treaty law. Because there is no customary law uh, of CBDR. Okay? So how do you do that? You do that in two steps. The first step is to actually define it as much as you can in the article. And you put it in Article 20 to make sure that no one reads that as a transversal provision that is going to be affecting the interpretation of all the other articles. And the second thing that you do is that you set up a committee which will probably be a standalone committee, not a compliance committee, but something closer, a hybrid. And that committee would, unlike uh, compliance committees, but like the Human Rights Committee, would have the ability to interpret, to adopt general comments in abstracto. That would actually give the committee the time to show in a longer document what CVDR means and why it is giving place to the legitimate uh, concerns of developing countries without essentially depriving of any content the part. So uh, I think I, I answered the three questions in a, in a blow. But, uh, uh, so this is, uh, this is I, what I had to say. Perfect. Thank you, Jorge. Jason? Sure, yes. Just a, a very uh, brief answer, really. Um, say, having looked at cooperation in, in various domains, um, including beyond international environmental law, um, you know, I think cooperation always works better um, in more specific and preferably institutional uh, contexts. Um, so that you know, tends to allow for specific standards to, to emerge, um, as has been uh, the experience, for example, in the area of social, cultural and economic rights. The Committee on Social, Cultural and Economic Rights have um, developed uh, cooperation under, under that convention. Uh, so I think it, it, it probably would, yes, um, provide for a, a, a better basis and, and particularly for operationalizing the, the principle an overarching principle and then more specific uh, context would probably be, be better for operation. Thank you. Luke, do you want to offer some? Hi, thank you. Je voudrais répondre à la dernière question sur la codification du droit euh, international de l'environnement. Évidemment, ici, c'est la codification des principes de base du droit de l'environnement. Ce n'est pas la codification du droit de l'environnement comme tel. Donc, si on voudrait codifier le droit international euh, euh, mondial, À ce moment, il faut évidemment mettre ensemble et coordonner tous ces, tous ces traités, les, les 100 ou plus mondiales, les, les 2000, 3000 euh, régionales et, et bilatérales, etc. Ce n'est pas le cas. Donc, c'est la codification des principes de, de base. Et donc, selon moi, le, euh, euh, ça veut aussi dire que ce sont des, la codification des principes de base mais aussi des principes minimaux. Donc ça veut dire que si dans certains secteurs euh, euh, on a pris euh, des mesures qui vont plus loin ou qui sont plus protecteurs, ils ne sont pas influencés euh, par le pacte. Donc c'est en principe, euh, c'est l'application du, du principe de non-régression sur le pacte euh, pour euh, euh, dire ainsi. Mais je sais que j'ai appris à Nairobi en janvier qu'il qu y a ici et là euh, des interrogations euh, sur ce point. 
peut-être il faut le clarifier et ce point, ce point là. Thank you very much. Uh, Luke, uh, uh, Geneva, do you have some final observations? If I can just add to the question um, shortly, uh, that one of the one of the additional value of uh, also the fact and of course of the system of implementation would be that having a standard of committee as um, I argued before would definitely definitely also help uh, states in interpretation and uh, of course in. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned, if this would be included afterwards. So, um, interpretation, but also helping through uh, the functioning system of uh, the implementation of environmental law overall. So, thank you again. Well, thank you very much um, to all the panelists.